Okay, so uh, presentation today is basically going to go from providing a bit of a, an overview of um, how I sort of got into stroke research. Um, and really the presentation is underpinned by empirical research. And empirical research that myself and colleagues at Massey University in New Zealand undertook between 2010 and, and, and 2014. That empirical research basically led us to the development of a vascular rehabilitation clinic, um, which was at the time uh, New Zealand's first secondary prevention program for patients with TIA, uh, minor stroke and peripheral arterial disease. So Lex has obviously provided a little bit of an overview of my background. Um, where my sort of interest in stroke initially originated was through a community-based program in Exeter. So when I was a master's student and into the early stages of my PhD, um, I ran what was known as, or probably still is, Action After Stroke, which is a exercise-based charity, has a charity status, whereby patients from the Exeter community could go to the campus, St Luke's campus at Exeter, and engage in twice-weekly exercise uh, sessions. The programme was really useful in terms of providing a form of physical rehabilitation for a, a wide range of stroke patients, from those who may be wheelchair-bound, patients who may have major uh, uh, ischemic events through to more uh, minor events. What, we also, what I would also say from that particular programme was that the importance of um, the psychosocial importance of, of exercise and community-based exercise was really uh, evident in that particular program. So that was my first experience really of engaging in um, working with, with a clinical population, uh, that being stroke patients. My PhD had nothing to do with stroke, but when I became, um, I suppose, my first academic position, which was actually in New Zealand, I thought this was an area of research which I wanted to uh, particularly focus upon. More specifically, I've decided to go down the route of utilizing or assessing the effect or the beneficial effect of exercise for patients with TIA and minor stroke. So TIA is a transient ischemic attack. It's basically where patients have signs and symptoms of stroke, which last less than 24 hours, typically less than one hour. Okay? Patients who have a minor stroke typically have a very, a very similar treatment strategy to TIA patients, but their signs and symptoms tend to last longer than 24 hours. One of the reasons I was particularly interested in TIA patients is the provision of care for patients who have a TIA or a minor stroke is, is really poor, by and large, in comparison to other cardiovascular or cerebrovascular conditions. These patients have very similar cardiovascular disease risk factors. They'll have elevated blood pressure, they'll potentially have high, um, high levels of uh, cholesterol, there'll be an increased risk of atherosclerosis, and they have this huge risk of having a secondary major cardiovascular complication, whether it's going to be a stroke, a myocardial infarction, death, or other uh, complications. So it's a, it's a population group which really um, doesn't probably get the care and attention that, that it actually deserves and, and requires. In the UK, there's 150,000 uh, strokes each year. There's 1.2 million people in the UK living with stroke. And each year, if you look at the Stroke Foundation statistics, there's 46,000 people over TIA. If you look into some of the Oxford stroke studies, you'll probably find that the minor stroke patients is an equivalent number to what you see here in terms of TIA patients. One of the big concerns with patients with TIA is that it's a, in essence it's a precursor to the risk of having a major cardiovascular or cerebrovascular complication. Depending upon the journal or uh, the article that you read, you'll probably see statistics somewhere between 20 to 40 percent of all TIA, TIA patients will have a significant cardiovascular or cerebrovascular event um, within, with, probably within 12 months of that initial TIA. Okay? If I looked into statistics from Wessex, so West, Wessex is the area that I'm currently based in, in Winchester, we have nine NHS Foundation Trusts, and in those nine NHS Foundation Trusts, in 2014 into 2015, there were 4,500 strokes. Of those patients, of those 4,500, 1,119, it was a secondary event. Okay? So 25% of the population of patients who have a stroke in the Wessex region, so in sort of the south, south region, it's a secondary event. They've had a precursor, they've had a warning sign, sign that something isn't quite right, but they're still having a secondary event. 
So this is where my primary interest comes in is, well, can we work with this population group? Can we administer lifestyle management programs, whether it's exercise, education, um, behavior change strategies, to try and reduce that risk of having a secondary event? Can we reduce the risk of death? Can we reduce the risk of, of myocardial infarctions, strokes, or recurrent follow-up CIS? Again, if we look into some of the statistics, we can see that there's, the, there's an increased risk and increased prevalence. So there's some numbers on the board there, which I won't go into. But if you look into the American Heart Association, uh, one of their big publications in 2013, they demonstrated that 12% of all TRI patients will die within a year of their initial death. Okay? So that's more American-based statistic, but it's quite a worrying statistic. If you look into more UK-based work, these patients had a 43% risk of having a cardiovascular complication within 10 years of their initial TRI. So there's a 50% chance, by and large, that these patients are going to have a major, major cardiovascular complication. This is obviously going to cause significant physical um, disability for the patient, potentially. It could lead to significant cognitive or emotional deficit, but also at large in terms of the healthcare setting, it's going to lead to a significant economic burden. So stroke costs the UK around about 7 billion each year. So if we can apply um, effective and affordable strategies to try and reduce that risk of stroke, we're also going to have a significant, we're going to elicit a significant benefit in terms of reducing economic burden for the NHS. So we can start to use those resources more effectively in other means. And this is where I like to think that uh, exercise and education, exercise clinics, community-based programs is a, is a sensible way forward because they should be, in theory, fairly cheap and easy to run, but can have a significant benefit both for the patient, for the social structure of that individual, but also with regards to the, the, the healthcare setting that, the, that, that those patients are immersed in, so the NHS. So what typically happens to a TIA patient? So by and large, the key stroke strategy is Fast. So basically, if an individual has signs and symptoms of a stroke, i.e. they're streaking in the face, with their arm, um, if they can't lift their arm up, if their speech, their language comprehension is poor, they should go to hospital straight away. So basically, 999, in the ambulance, go to hospital. Once an individual is at the hospital, they'll have their specific clinical workup. So they'll have brain imaging, they may well have some carotid imaging, and they'll basically be classified into either having a TIA, a major stroke or a minor stroke. And these patients are then given pretty much a cocktail of medication, which is very standardized by and large. They'll get an anticoagulant medication, they'll get an antiplatelet, and they'll probably get either a lipid lowering or an antihypertensive. So some of the research that I've been involved in, typically we see medication post PIA, they have about three or four meds, okay? New meds. And these meds that they're going to be administered might be dependent upon other clinical comorbidities that they may have. Okay. Once they've had these medications, they're discharged from hospital, they might be given some educational information, which might be through uh, a leaflet. Um, but basically those patients are then discharged, and they may well then come back to the hospital at three months for a TIA clinic follow-up. That's pretty much the care that's provided. And this is a population group that are at increased risk of a secondary event, a major cardiovascular complication or cerebrovascular events such as a major, uh, major stroke. But they don't get the same support as what you may find with a patient with myocardial infarction. So a patient with an MI, possibly they go through phase one through phase four cardiac rehabilitation. They have um, exercise sessions with registered and experienced practitioners, probably six weeks worth in-house cardiac rehabilitation. They'll have face-to-face -face education, looking at smoking cessation strategies, diets, medication, physical activity and so on. And then they'll progress their way through to try and reduce that risk of having a secondary myocardial infarction or alternative cardiovascular complication. So my sort of take on things is, well, we've got this population group which nothing really is being done for them. There's no real opportunity. There's nothing structured or monitored to get these patients into programs to try and reduce that risk of having a secondary event. A recent meta-epidemiological study in the British Medical Journal demonstrated that exercise is as good, if not better, than some of these specific medications that typically prescribe to stroke patients after, after diagnosis. So there's evidence out there that exercise should form an important part of that strategy. And by and large, it should be more likely an adjunct to the medication. So it's this lifestyle behaviour, it's this lifestyle management programme 
which is used in combination with medication to try and improve those health outcomes. But there's probably a critical window is when to implement these exercise sessions. So on all the research that was undertaken prior to maybe some of the work that I've undertaken, they would recruit patients anywhere from straight after the event up to five years post TIM, engage them in exercise, and then see does it have an influence on these cardiovascular disease risk factors, whether it's blood pressure, cholesterol, or whatever. So for me though, there should be this critical window, and that critical window should probably be in that first three months. You know, if you think about behaviour change and trying to get people immersed and involved in exercise, they've just had this warning sign, they've had this blip that something isn't quite right with regards to blood flow within the brain. So if we can engage these people with appropriate exercise and education strategies soon after, well, we could have a significant benefit downstream, i.e. we engage them in physical activity, we reduce that risk of the secondary event, and we reduce the risk of early death. So in 2010, I had the pleasure of meeting a stroke consultant at Wellington Regional Hospital in New Zealand, who's very passionate about trying to develop some form of secondary prevention and community-based program for this population group. And that chap actually left and is now working at York NHS Foundation Trust. And I'll come back to that in a, in a couple of slides' time. But having stroke consultants who are passionate about research is really important with regards to identifying appropriate treatment strategies for these patients through the value of empirical research. So that, that'll come back to more bit. So a lot of my work initially started off with looking at the short-term and long-term efficacy of engaging patients into an exercise and education program soon after their TIA or minor stroke. And we want to evaluate what's the benefit of this program in terms of physiological markers, very much cardiovascular disease risk factors, but also psychosocial health outcomes. Uh, can, we have an, can we have an effect? Can we improve the outcome of these individuals in the acute stage, but also more chronically? With this uh, initial study, so I've, undertake, I've undertaken three randomised controlled trials in New Zealand. The initial study was one of the biggest studies that, that I've been involved in. We recruited 60 uh, TIA patients. And in that study, what we, um, what we wanted to try and do is, is basically, as I said, we, what we wanted to try and provide this overarching um, interpretation or feel for the data with regards to does exercise have a beneficial effect on these physiological and psychosocial outcomes. So we had a series of inclusion exclusion criteria, and by and large, this is the criteria that we've administered um, throughout each of the randomised controlled trials that I've been involved in. First of all, we wanted to recruit only patients who have their first TIA. Okay. In the future, we probably also look in terms of looking at uh, initial and secondary TIAs. Um, but in terms of trying to keep the research question nice and refined, we decided just to look at uh, first TIA diagnosis. They had to be identified by stroke consultants at Wellington Regional Hospital, and we typically recruited patients who are classified as being high risk. There's different measures, different scales that are used to determine stroke severity. One that's used for the ABC, one that's used for TIA patients is known as the ABCD2, and typically there's a scale from zero to seven. Anything over four is considered a high risk TIA, anything less than four is considered more of a low risk TIA. And those patients with a high risk TIA basically have a range of cardiovascular disease risk factors. Okay, so they've had their event, but they also might have elevated systolic blood pressure, they might have elevated total cholesterol or other factors. Okay. They also have to live within the Catalan Coast District Health Board, which is basically the equivalent of an NHS Foundation Trust. They have to live within, within the area. It just allowed us to track patients a little bit, uh, a little bit easier uh, later on. Exclusion criteria, by and large, was just driven by the potential that these patients would be engaged in exercise. So we wanted to ensure that there weren't any significant, um, or as practitioners, as academics, that the individuals that would be coming in and would be actually administering exercise would reduce that risk of having a major cardiovascular complication. So the first thing we wanted to do was, um, can we, is it feasible to recruit this population into an exercise program? So they've had, a, they've had their TIA or a minor stroke. Typically, normal care is that they go home, they take the medication, they'll pop in back to the hospital for three months, and that's pretty much then done. Okay? So we wanted to see, well, if we're going to administer an exercise program soon after the event, is it feasible? 
Okay? TIA patients, for example, they can't drive for 28 days post-diagnosis. So there's a window where it actually becomes quite challenging for these patients to get to your facility to administer exercise because they can't drive themselves. So you're dependent upon either public transport or their social support through carers or maybe through um, you know, members of the family to actually help them um, get to the centre for you to administer your exercise programme. So we wanted to first of all identify, can we recruit patients to this type of programme? And what's, what's our compliance? And it's quite a labour intensive programme. They, they've had their event, they can go home, they can pop pills, and in theory, because it's usual care, by popping three pills or four pills each day, a couple times a day, in theory, you, those patients might think that that's the best way for them to, to treat that condition. Okay? So we also wanted to see, well, if they're going to have to come to our centre for 90 minute, twice weekly exercise, well, are they actually going to do that? Are they going to adhere to that program? So we wanted to make sure on that as well. And as I'm sure you're aware, randomized controlled trials, clinical based research, distant improvement is the biggest challenge. So, if you looked into some of the health technology assessment uh, studies that have been funded in the UK, participant recruitment or adherence to exercise based programs is anywhere between 20% and 80%. So, some studies have significant participant dropout, others do not. And this is looking at similar, similar clinical conditions, so it's patients with heart failure, patients with cardiovascular disease older age population. Okay. So there is this um, concern, you could say, that, that because it's such a labour-intensive programme for the patient, that they may not actually actually adhere to that. So in this study, because it was a pilot study, pilot stroke feasibility study, we wanted to recruit 60 patients, 30 in each arm, 30 patients in an exercise programme. We called the exercise programme HEPAP, HEP, Health Enhancing Physical Activity Programme, if you're going to do uh, clinical research, you've got an acronym, okay? So we did, HEPAP was our acronym from the study, which is basically exercise and education, and we had usual care control. So we had 60 patients that we wanted to recruit. You can see that we had a significant number of diagnoses within our, uh, within our district health board, 285 diagnoses, which uh, occurred over a nine month recruitment window. So 285 people in our area uh, had, had a stroke. I had a TIA. We typically recruited through the outpatient screens because of the collaboration that I had with specific stroke consultants. Okay. So there's lots of other unanswered questions in terms of the feasibility of recruitment from the inpatient setting. And we invited 97 patients who met our inclusion exclusion criteria. Okay. So 97 patients met, met the criteria, of which we recruited 60, giving us a 63% participant recruitment, which for a clinical trial, or this type of clinical trial, is pretty good. Okay. So the first thing we wanted to see, before I start to delve into data and discuss how we actually structured the, the session, was where do we recruit from? What's the feasibility? How far could people live from our, our uh, assessment session or where we administer our exercise program? And how likely are we that they can actually even come to us? So we found, by and large, that we 80% of those individuals who live within 20k, so around about 12, 13 miles, 80% of those individuals would actually engage in our program. The further you move away, unsurprisingly, the less likely they're going to the less likely they're going to take part. But we've had occasions whereby patients would be 45 kilometres up the coast from where we'd be, so say 30 miles or so, and they would either get a taxi or the equivalent of a taxi to come into Wellington to engage in a twice week exercise programme at a cost that they would have to incur, or they would get a train in and then a bus up to our centre. So for some people, straight away they've had this blip and then switched on that this is an opportunity that I could engage in a program which might help reduce the risk of further events or improve general health outcomes. So the first thing, by and large, it was that you know, we were able to recruit uh, fairly well. So feasibility of that was, was pretty good. But this is where it becomes important is that when I recruit, when I did follow-up research studies, the second and the third study, our recruitment and our referral rate was, was much poorer. And the reason being is that we didn't have stroke consultants who are actually that passionate or that involved in research. Because really, it's an extra piece of work for those stroke consultants. They're viewing these, these patients either in the inpatient or the outpatient setting, and they're then going to have to match specific criteria to see whether they meet recruitment for the study. So in our first study, we had someone who was very passionate about this. They thought that they, they saw the value or potential value of exercise and lifestyle management programs. 
When that individual returns to the UK, we then had an interim lead or head stroke consultant. And he wasn't so engaged. Okay? And as such, he started to show more. Okay. So the value of the program is very much dependent from what happens at the uh, cold face, you could say, in terms of within the hospital setting, all the way through to us being obviously practitioners and trying to administer these programs. So in this initial study, we recruited 60 patients. Each patient, once we recruited them, would, would take part in a baseline health assessment. So typically, this baseline health assessment would, would occur around about seven days after their diagnosis. Ideally, we try and get them in within two to three days post diagnosis. But by basically the feasibility of doing that was, was particularly challenging in terms of we would be provided information from the clinical nurse specialist, this patient has a TIA. We'd contact that patient, we'd arrange a date for them to come in, they'd come into the lab, we'd then conduct an assessment. And by and large, it took around about seven days to do this baseline health assessment. We'd always, always administer a health history questionnaire, which would be basically the HSM version of the health history questionnaire. We'd then conduct a resting and exercise ECG stress test using the modified boost protocol. Um, to basically provide us with a better indication of clinical suitability of this individual to engage in our exercise program. So by and large, of those 60 patients who engaged in our program, uh, most patients would have been um, would have been able to engage in our program without any cause of concern. Okay. But at times, there was the odd patient whereby we would detect on their ECG that there might have been other cardiovascular issues, cardiovascular complications. So we would then contact the GP and inform the GP for this patient to come in for assessment. We think there's a slight concern here. You might need to check him out in terms of, you know, in terms of a, um, a specialist in terms of the actual ECG trace. We conduct a cardiovascular disease risk factor assessment. So we look at body composition through waist and hips, hips circumference and the ratio. We also provide indication of BMI. We get an indication of the blood liquid profile, fasting blood glucose, uh, blood pressure. Uh, and then activity status and smoking status. And this would really drive our primary outcome, that being blood pressure. Blood pressure is the biggest risk factor for stroke patients. Okay? It's a big thing that we want to reduce. So if we can reduce blood pressure, we're going to reduce that risk of We'd also administered a series of psychosocial questionnaires, ranging from health and well-being questionnaires, such as the SF36, through to the IPAC, the International Physical Activity Questionnaire. We looked at anxiety and depression through the HADS. We looked at the POMS, which is, um, looking back now, probably wasn't the best tool to use, but we looked, used the POMS for uh, profile and mood states. And we also had a stroke awareness questionnaire. Because we were administering education as a part of our program, we also wanted to see, had their awareness of the signs and symptoms of stroke improved? So if they, are, if they do have a secondary event, are they more aware that they are having a secondary event and as such they go to hospital at a sooner time than the I provided a statistic earlier that there's 46,000 TIAs in the UK, but that number is going to be an underestimate of the true number of TIAs because patients don't recognise the signs and symptoms of the event. So it's probably much higher than that 46,000. Once we completed the baseline, we then administer uh, a randomisation procedure. So we used a simple randomisation procedure whereby participants would be allocated to either an exercise or a control group. Our exercise group was basically twice weekly, eight week exercise program. Each session was 90 minutes in duration. I was a mixture of aerobic and resistance exercise. Resistance exercise would be um, six core exercises, upper body and lower body, but also trying to challenge these individuals using dumbbells, etc., like fairly lightweight, using low balls and sort of instability devices as well. The aerobic portion would be a mixture of walking and cycling based exercise whereby typically patients would start at 50% of their age predicted maximum heart rate and each week we progress it by approximately 5% until around that 85% of their age predicted maximum heart rate. When we completed the exercise ECG stress test, one of our key criteria for test determination was 85% of age predicted maximum heart rate. Okay, so patients would all be exercising at submaximum intensity. We did try and have a structure to the progress, but obviously if we had more of a clinic environment, you would manipulate that intensity a little bit more uh, in an individualised manner to ensure that you get better out of the patient. In terms of research study, for this initial research study, we try to keep it a little bit more controlled in terms of progress. 
Within that eight weeks, we also have an education session, and these will be group-based exercise sessions. So we would have probably five or six patients uh, coming into an exercise session. They'll be working one-to-one -one with a practitioner, and that practitioner would be a third-year clinical exercise prescription student, and those students would be uh, supervised at all times by basically myself. Okay? So we'd have students working with patients under the arch or the band of supervision. They'd also have an education component, which would be a, uh, an opportunity for patients as a group, along with the practitioner, to talk through key concepts of education, whether it's diet, risk factors, physical activity, goal setting, cognitive function, emotional issues. They would have basically a battery of um, educational um, discussion points that we'd work through with the patients. Following this, we then do a post-intervention assessment. Post-intervention post -intervention is identical to what we'd undertake at baseline, so it would be all these measures, and we'd repeat that three months post, and we also have a 12 months post. So from here, we could look at the acute benefit of exercise, the short-term benefit, in terms of including the three month, and a longer-term benefit. So the longitudinal part is probably the, the most important stuff. If we can demonstrate benefit soon after, the next big question is, can they maintain that benefit for 12 months? Okay. So that was probably the big question that we wanted to try and get to. So apologies, a lot of this, uh, my presentation today is just kind of pasted from articles. So uh, it's, it's a lot of tabular um, presentation. So in a nutshell, we have exercise and control group. Baseline, post-intervention, three-month follow-up. No differences in our cardiovascular disease risk factors between our exercise and our control group at baseline. So no significant difference. What we found in our control group is that there's a slight decrease in blood pressure. So systolic blood pressure is our primary outcome. It's our primary marker of interest. If we're going to change anything through an exercise and education program, we want to change blood pressure. Okay, that's the first thing. Obviously, we're interested in our secondary outcomes, but we lead on blood pressure in this example. And this is peripheral blood pressure. Okay? At a later date, other markers of blood pressure in this presentation will become uh, apparent that they may actually be more important than peripheral blood pressure. So we saw a slight change between baseline and follow-up, only around about one to two millimeters of mercury. But we showed in our those individuals who engaged in exercise around about 11 millimeter mercury change, around about 9% change in their blood pressure. So this is medication plus a structured eight-week, twice-weekly monitored exercise program. So that was really encouraging finding for us. The effect size is only moderate, basically due to the, or probably driven by our fairly limited sample size, sample size of 60 people. But we also demonstrated similar effects in terms of our total cholesterol. So we're seeing that blood lipid profile and blood pressure can significantly improve soon after the event, oh, uh, can significantly improve following an eight-week exercise program. In this paper, not only do we demonstrate that those benefits occur straight after, but those benefits can be maintained at three months. Okay? So this, the presentation of this data was presented with an intention to treat approach. So in this study, we had 60 patients, and over the course of the entire study, we had nine patients drop out. Okay, so at this, month, at this point here, with the three month follow up, we had nine patients who, who dropped out. I think it's nine patients at this point. So we used an intention to treat approach, so it allowed us to try and keep our sample size up uh, and all the time. So we had encouraging trends there. We also demonstrated significant improvements in markers of aerobic fitness as well. Okay, so we're showing that short term wise, there's, there's significant benefit. James, can I just say, those nine patients who dropped out, did they just drop out through lack of interest? Uh, a bit of a mix. So um, we would have, geez, um, over the course of the 12 months, we had one patient death. No, yeah, we had one patient death, which was in a control group. And that was an individual came in for an assessment with myself soon after diagnosis. Five weeks later, had a major uh, hemorrhage and passed away from that event. Uh, the other eight were basically a mixture of typically control group participants who didn't want to continue to engage and come to, this, to the lab for, for a two-hour assessment on these two occasions. Um, with the exercise group, we had people who would move away from the area, move up the coast, other bits and pieces. So it wasn't, um, I think it's just a standard dropout rate through a typical clinical trial. Uh, but there was one here, there was one patient there. Over the course of this, um, 
Over the course of the 12-month program, there are six recurring TIAs, okay, four in the control group, two in the exercise group. Okay? But again, small sample size, that doesn't really lead to anything. So in this particular uh, paper, what we were interested in was can we, we've shown that there's, a, that, that there's short term benefit, there's acute benefit, can it be maintained at, at 12 months? So this is really the, the, the big paper, I would say, published in quite a good journal, which we basically demonstrated that yes, those patients can maintain it. Okay? One of the concerns, well not concerns, but one of the issues that we've had since this point is how do we how are we confident that that maintenance over that 12 month period is due to what we administered at eight weeks, uh, in, in that initial eight weeks of, of diagnosis. And we actually, it's a diff difficult one to allude to. We use the International Physical Activity Questionnaire to try and monitor, try and map physical activity participation at these different assessment time points. But it didn't really give us any differences between our group. I don't think it was probably sensitive enough to allow us to show that perhaps those individuals in the exercise group actually. Um, took part in more exercise or exercise at a higher intensity or whatever it may have been. So I guess there's a little bit of an assumption here that we're, we're, we're assuming this because of the, they've engaged in this program early on, but you can't precisely tell. Some of the other things that came out from this particular um, study was, yes, we demonstrated that if you engage in exercise, you, you may have short-term and long-term effects. If you engage in an exercise and education program, but one of the issues I had with reviewers was, in terms of empirical research, well, do you know whether it's due to your own exercise, your resistance exercise, or is it due to the education? And we can allude to that. We, we can't say whether a aerobic exercise is more important than resistance or the education part. Are they changing habits outside of their eight week program, which is actually causing the greatest change? So we can never answer that question. So I have a PhD student in New Zealand at the moment who is trying to answer a facet of that, whereby his PhD is looking at an aerobic training program versus a resistance training program versus so we're trying to tease out some of those um, sort of hidden questions. If you ask a clinician or a consultant, they'll basically say it doesn't matter as long as they're improving, as long as they're getting these benefits. But in terms of having a research hat on, and as you probably just want to try and, and deliver an exercise program that is most beneficial to the patients, you know, can you get away with doing 45 minutes of work exercise and ignoring the resistance? That becomes a much more streamlined and effective strategy than having a 90 minute session. So, those sort of questions definitely need to be answered. We also showed uh, beneficial changes in terms of uh, body composition as well, but again, it's really that systolic blood pressure that sort of led a lot of our uh, conversations. In terms of psychosocial health, well, these, the, the, the group of patients typically don't perceive, or if you meet them, don't tend to come across any major mental. Um, disabilities after their, their event because it is a TIA or a minor stroke. So when we use the SF36 as our marker of general health and well-being, it gives us eight different assessments of physical or mental health. Although we didn't demonstrate any changes in mental health, we did demonstrate improvements in their physical perception. So how they felt that in terms of their physical ability to engage in everyday activities, their ability to engage in aspects of everyday quality of life, whether it's going to the shop, those sort of things. So again, it's only a 60 subject uh, study, but we've seen somewhere between a five to around that eight percent improvement in their physical perception of their ability to undertake everyday distractive um, activities. So, at the, I left New Zealand in January 2015, took my post at Winchester in February 2015. And before I left, I thought, well, what could be really interesting is to try and identify over a longer term follow up period how many of these individuals have actually, or can we assess clinical outcome measures? Okay? Blood pressure is the most important marker that we typically want to see in terms of a research laboratory environment because it's easy to measure, it's easy to monitor. But if we can have real benefit with this type of program, it's the clinical outcomes those outcomes that are being measured and assessed at the hospital, which is where there's been the greatest benefit. So in this study, we basically took those 60 patients, so this, the initial study was undertaken in 2010 and into 2011, and three and a half years later, on average, it's somewhere between three years, three months, to three years, nine months, based on recruitment, we looked at the number of patients who 
been to hospital with a stroke diagnosis, with a marker on the function, who had died, uh, who had cardiovascular, some form of cardiovascular surgery. Um, um, number of hospital admissions, these sort of markers. Okay? To see if, is there a difference between our two groups? Okay? Is there a difference in this follow-up period about how many times these people basically come to hospital? So in this study, which is currently under review, um, we demonstrated that, first of all, the number of strokes was significantly fewer in our exercise group. So in that follow-up period, those individuals who took part in the exercise program, we observed that there were six stroke forms of stroke diagnosis compared to 18 in our control group. Okay. We also demonstrated, although the numbers are obviously very small, that there were fewer deaths. There's three deaths in our control group compared to zero deaths in our exercise group. And probably the most important one is if we try to lead this forward is the hospital admissions in terms of economic burden for a healthcare setting, i.e. the NHS. We demonstrated that in our exercise group, our 30 patients attended 48 visits to hospital to, to, um, emergency, to the emergency department or the inpatient setting compared to 102. Okay. Nice trends, sounds good, looks good on the table. However, we can't say again whether this is due to our exercise program. We can't say that our exercise program has caused this beneficial effect. Okay, because our research wasn't designed, our, our, our research wasn't designed to assess clinical outcomes. This is a secondary analysis, and this may never get published because we can't allude to what's actually happened in that period in between diagnosis and follow-up. But it's a table. It's, a, it's an analysis which provides an interesting trend, I think at least, in terms of something that requires further investigation. Because if we can reduce the number of people that are having a stroke, i.e. Uh, a stroke consultant's time, the time to image an individual, the cost of a carotid endorectomy, uh, the cost of the medication that comes with this, the cost of the social care package and the, um, outside uh, of the hospital environment, if we can demonstrate that this type of program is effective, it could be real value. It could be real value uh, in terms of administering a simple program. And you think it should work. Worldwide, cardiac rehabilitation programs are administered because it's, it's been empirically shown, at least in certain facets of cardiac rehabilitation, that's an effective strategy to reduce that risk of having a second event. So I think in terms of stroke, and particularly TIA and minor stroke, we're quite a way behind in terms of demonstrating that. So where did we go to from here? So we've demonstrated a nice study that exercise has these beneficial effects. Well, we then thought, well, can we start to see, can we start looking to maybe some of the mechanisms why exercise might be beneficial? Okay, can we see, um, can we try and can we try and allude to physiologically as academics, as researchers, why this exercise is good? Not just that it decreases blood pressure. It improves health status, but why does it do that? So we decided to come up with a bit of a research study. If this picks up, I'm not too sure if it will. That's disappointing. I might have to show you a file in there. But basically, we then wanted to look at arterial stiffness. Okay? So a number of patients, when they go into hospital, they have you beat them over the ultrasound to look at an image of the coronary artery. Okay, and I was very fortunate in my previous department, this individual here, Dr. Lee Stone, who is a top, top researcher in terms of non-invasive methodologies to assess cardiovascular health, uh, was in my department, and we basically decided that we'd look at arterial stiffness of, these, of, of, a, sub, of a different group of TIA and minor stroke patients. So in the second study, what we basically do, patients would be referred to us as they were in the first study. We conduct exactly the same assessment. But when we'd be taking their resting ECG and their resting blood pressure, we'd also image their carotid artery. Okay, we'd take three 10 second images of the carotid artery, and what we're basically interested in is we want to see how much movement there is into that artery. Okay? The more rigid it is, the bigger the risk factor. The, uh, the bigger the risk factor it is for an individual to have a secondary event. So basically, arterial stiffness has been shown to be an independent risk factor for significant cardiovascular and cerebral vascular events. So what we basically want to do, we want to try and reduce stiffness and improve compliance and sensibility. We want to, to um, demonstrate that the vessel, the coronary artery, becomes more elastic and malleable. So it can help massage blood up to the, to the brain rather than it firing blood up, which in turn could increase the risk of 
images or, or other events. Okay. So in this study, we assessed arterial stiffness. We then engaged patients in exactly the same program, eight weeks. Uh, we didn't have the education portion, but we did have ex uh, aerobic and resistance exercise. And we looked at various markers. Um, first of all, we demonstrated, like in the initial study, so quite important in terms of validity, I would say, in terms of the, um, um, uh, the initial findings, is that we demonstrated significant improvements in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So this is immediately after, this is eight weeks after diagnosis. So those individuals who engaged in the exercise program, we saw around about a 6% improvement in systolic blood pressure, so a little bit less than the previous study. And there's actually a really huge change in diastolic blood pressure, so only 10%. What we were interested in really in this study was looking at compliance and sensibility. So compliance is the absolute change in cross-sectional area of the carotid artery for a given pressure, while the sensibility is the relative change in cross-sectional area for a given pressure. In this study, we were able to demonstrate that there was a 17% improvement in compliance and a 23% improvement in sensibility for those individuals who, who took part in the exercise. So in theory, you might assume that the artery has become more elastic, okay? become more malleable in terms of providing more distributed blood to the brain, which is a good thing. Okay? That's quite a big change, again, from only an eight-week program. However, and we never actually ran the regression analysis in this time, I have no idea why. Um, we don't know whether this improvement is being driven by changes in blood pressure or is it being driven potentially by changes in the elastic properties of the vessel? We've shown that there's an improvement, but again, we haven't quite alluded to why that's the case. Okay. This, that's the second study. The second study was uh, a master's student, a really good master's student, uh, engaged in this project over the course of a 12 month uh, window. And actually, actually recruit, we had to recruit longer than the 12 months. Uh, so, RT submitted his LSC because of issues with referrals. But it was an encouraging trend that there's an improvement in compliance and sensibility. So that's one thing. In our third study, um, we then started moving to markers of, of health, which um, I don't have, so not really my expertise, but we collaborated with the University of Otago. So in New Zealand, the top two universities is Auckland University, the University of Auckland, University of Otago, and they have really good, uh, basically medical schools. Okay, so a lot of funding and support goes to those universities. Anyway, in this study, we had the opportunity to um, collaborate with a chap called Sheikh Zeng who is a specialist in looking at cerebral blood flow. So they, in their lab at Otago, they have a uh, transcranial Doppler looking at blood velocity or blood flow through the middle cerebral artery. Again, you can look at both the asymptomatic and, and uh, symptomatic side of the patient. In this study, what we demonstrated, we compared basically TIA patients versus a control group in terms of blood flow, blood velocity within the actual brain. Okay. Although we didn't see, and this, this is pre-exercise, so this isn't looking at effective exercise, this is just a comparison between a healthy control population and our TIA patients. And what the study basically demonstrated was that in our TIA patients, blood pressure variability was much higher, was significantly higher in our TIA patients compared to our control patients. So what we are alluding to from this particular study is that if you're going to administer exercise programs, and obviously the brain is the place where we're having these strokes or TIAs or mind strokes, whatever it might be, blood pressure variability may be a key marker that we should look for in terms of identifying the true benefit of exercise. So we start to maybe move away from what's happening peripherally in the arm. So we could look at changes in blood pressure within the brain, such as you know, developing from this type of research. And this is quite the technique of actually assessing uh, blood velocity through or blood flow through the middle of three branches is quite a complex, it's quite a skilled uh, um, technique. That's one marker that we could potentially look towards. The other one is actually looking at central blood pressures. And there's a device out there uh, known as the Sphygma Court. I don't know if you have one here. Sphygma Court. It looks like a normal blood pressure measuring device. You measure blood pressure on the left arm. So it's the gold standard non invasive measure of central blood pressure. So what's actually happening at the heart itself? The pressure how much the heart has to work to actually get blood out to, to the body. Okay? So some of our research is also starting to look into more central measures of blood pressure rather than just the peripheral measure. Because the difference in blood pressure between the central and the periphery can be quite significant. Is that like the Tango? You've got a Tango, which is a PG 
Um, I've never seen or used the tango, so I, I don't know. Um, the stigma core, in terms of the UK, the stigma core isn't, I think it's only really been used in a couple of institutions, I believe, but in the States, it's actually starting to move into clinical practice, whereby if an individual goes through a health checkup in the States, they can get measures and markers of central blood pressures. So this is something that we're starting to look towards as well in terms of that. So where did this lead to? Well, the initial study basically, because we developed a good rapport with our local hospital, from there we decided we set up our own community clinic, called, which we called the Vascular Rehab Clinic, which was for minor stroke, TIA patients, and we also recruited some health patients. So this clinic was basically set up based on a little bit of internal university funding. Uh, the university I was at, we had what was known as a strategic innovation fund, and they gave me probably around about 13 or 14 thousand pounds to try and get something up and running. Um, I didn't see it through because so I come back to the UK, but the clinic's still going now. So it's 18 months since the inception, and they still uh, have a good rapport relationship with the hospital, whereby patients are being referred into the program. So it's not. It's not so much for research purposes at the moment, but it, it should be, okay, in terms of um, how the clinic should be implemented in the life. The whole purpose with this clinic was within 12 months is that we would then go back to the district health board, the equivalent of the NHS Foundation Trust, and try and demonstrate whether there's significant, well, well okay, patient benefit, but probably more important for the healthcare trust is that one for the money, is there an economic benefit? And since I've moved away, that question and the actual purpose of why this clinic was, was set up hasn't actually gone through. But by and large, this clinic runs four times a week, morning and evenings, okay, uh, on different days to try and um, provide opportunities for individuals who may be retired, for those individuals who may still work, to have equal opportunity to attend an exercise program. So in the first three months, so I was there for the first three months of the programme, we had 40 referrals from the hospital, which we recruited 30 people, so 75% recruitment. And we basically followed the same sort of strategy as what we had in our research study. We'd, we'd ensure that we'd undertake a detailed baseline health assessment with our ECG and, and clinical suitability to take part in the programme. We'd then administer an exercise programme, which would be a little bit more individualised, and then an assessment and follow up as well. The clinic should be devised for three main purposes. One is, is community benefit, okay? It's providing an opportunity, it's good for the university to show that this is what we're immersing ourselves in within, within our local community. There's opportunities for patients to come in and engage in this sort of program. So that's one benefit of the program. The second one should be research in the future. Okay? They should be able to um, utilize this clinic, this facility as an opportunity to, to, to try and increase our knowledge and understanding of the benefit of exercise and intervention packages. And the third one is learning and teaching. So our students, our third year students, would have to be involved in that project in, in, in the program. So the course, the undergraduate course that I was teaching on in New Zealand, they didn't have to do a dissertation. Okay? They had to do a practicum. And a practicum would be 200 hours of face to face contact with different population groups. And they'd have to do three case studies. And one of their case studies, as it is at the moment as well, is working in the clinic. So they would have to go to the clinic as a part of their course to engage in the program, to, to get engaging hours, and their case study would be working with, would be the write up of their interaction and hopefully the improvement in health outcomes of the patient that they've worked with. Okay? It also gives those students an opportunity to engage in quite technical aspects of the health assessment in terms of the ECG, the interpretation, the analysis, and so on. So that's three sort of facets in terms of where we have to go. Um, but the clinic is still running 18 months in. Um, whether it's going to get to where it should be, which is ideally going to the district health board with a report saying, this is the number of patients we've had, this is the improvement, and this is what we can save you, that's what it needs to get to. And that's very similar, really, to what probably needs to be administered here uh, in the UK with this, with this group. So I'll come back to the UK. I've been in the UK now for 15 months. Um, at a small institution, the University of Winchester, just down the road from Winchester is the University of Southampton, which is one of the biggest players in terms of health research in the UK. Um, very strong link between the University of Southampton and Southampton General Hospital. So I've got challenges myself just based on my locality in terms of trying to get this sort of thing up and running. 
So for me, various things that need to be on the table. One, we need to see, can we recruit and comply patients into this sort of program in the UK? In New Zealand, we had a very homogenous population. Basically, white New Zealanders, by and large, that was our recruitment. For some reason, we did get referrals of Maori Pacifica patients. Whether that would be that they didn't actually go to hospital once they had the sign of symptoms of the TI, or whether they weren't being flowed up, or whatever it was, we had a very homogenous sample. In the UK, with the ethnic diversity, um, maybe not so much in Winchester, which is like 94% white British, but if we start to administer these programs in the city, Birmingham, London, or wherever, we can start to see can we recruit and comply patients to these type of programs. Next one is where do we administer these programs? So, some research studies, uh, Lennon and Blake in 2008, was doing something fairly sort of similar. They administered the program in a cardiac rehab center. Okay, they were getting these patients, they would immerse them in a program with cardiac patients. So, do we administer a, pro a program, a clinic, community, or a clinic within the hospital setting? Do we go into more of a community center setting, such as a sports center, or do you go into more of a university environment? So. There's things that need to be teased out in terms of where's the best place to, to administer. When do we start such programs? Do we try and start a program um, you know, within a couple of days of the events? Seven days, 14 days? When, when, is the, when is the most effective time to actually start that program? What we've administered is, is, is a standard, standard program at the moment. 50 to 85% with heart rate max. You can, ex you can do aerobic exercise, you can do some resistance. There's so many questions that we haven't alluded to in terms of what's the optimal program that we administer. Could it be HIIT training? You know, could there be the opportunity to do some high intensity interval training with the patients? Could it be the modality of exercise that we administer? Could it be the frequency? Could it be the timing of the session? There's lots and lots of opportunities to delve into some of these research programs. And then the next one, the big one, is how do we support the costs? So something I'm, I'm aware of at the moment is um, trying to get Clinical research up and running with the NHS. In New Zealand, I was, I was saying to this to Lex earlier, in New Zealand, I have a very good rapport with the hospital, and they would basically recruit patients as and when they could, by and large. With the NHS, it seems much more uh, formulated in that we actually have to buy out clinical research nurse time so they could identify, discuss the study with patients, recruit the study, the recruit patients, and so on. So for example, if I, if I wanted to run a 12-month um, a recruitment study into a lifestyle management program, exercise and education, and I wanted a clinical research nurse to give up the equivalent of a day a week of their time, which would probably be around about one to two hours every morning, or say an hour and a half every morning for a week, to view patients, potentially discuss the study and so on, that costs around about £15,000. Doesn't sound a lot, but if you suddenly want to do a multi-site trial and you want to bring in 10, 10 different NHS Foundation trusts, it's £150,000 just to support recruitment, let alone the actual administering of the program. So there's lots of um, other issues, you know, beyond patient benefit that also need to be considered. Um, and these are some of the challenges that I definitely have uh, at the moment as I want to try and get these things up and running. So I don't have a clinic per se up and running in, in Winchester at the moment. I've got a PhD student who's involved in some uh, NHS-based um, research with stroke patients and the plan is to get to the exercise component, uh, but we're not there yet in any of this first year. So, um, yes, yeah, definitely some, some challenges. That's some references. Any questions?